space. Well, not really. Take two. Here, in the Mitten State. Welcome to Code 47, bringing you all things Star Trek. Spanning the quadrants, the best things since the neutral zone. With your co-captains, Charlie Carden and Alex Terry. We are back for our first and hopefully last oops episode. <laughs> Everybody, this is uh, the Secret Friends Unite Code 47 podcast coming at you, talking about some Star Trek. My name is Charlie Carden, your Trek Lord of West Michigan, uh, joined as always by my partner, the Jedi pirate Trek Lord of the North, Mr. Alex Terry. Uh, Alex, how the hell are you? Oh, if I was any better, I'd be dangerous. Oh, man. Deadly dangerous. My goodness. Well, yeah, this is uh, this is a bit of an oops episode because, uh, you know, in the in the off season, uh, referring to the fact that, you know, there's new new episodes of Star Trek show being broadcast. We are doing a weekly retro recap. Uh, our goal is to recap all of the shows, all of the movies, but we split the seasons in half so that we can dive into you know the seasons more more uh, expertly and not have a super long episode. Well, we're doing our planning, and this this led to the planning spreadsheet, which we now have. But uh, we plan to have <laughs> to do season one of TNG, and we uh, back in October, and we decided to swap it out. Uh, somehow, when we started talking about the Mandalorian, we did Mando and we did Star Trek uh, Star Trek the Motion Picture. So the first half of TNG, as opposed to the last half, of TNG, <laughs> we covered we covered a couple episodes back. Uh, just got dropped, so we never did it. Uh, so we are going to fix that, and this is going to be our serious oopsie. Uh, but yeah, we're going to get right on into it. So uh, I, I I have to say this is still Charlie and I argued about this because I'm like this is like some Mandela effect shit. Right. Like I'm like, dude, I swear to God, we were talking about uh, a counter at Farpoint, and I made a reference to the Jem Hadar and the connection, and I was like, I'm losing my mind. I was walking around. <laughs> I mean, talking of all places, I was walking around Meyer like a week ago, and thinking about the fact that oh, we just had recorded the second half, and I'm like. Uh, why am I not remembering when we did the first half? And I had to go home. I had to get it. I had to get into the folder. I had to scroll through the the flow docs. I had to scroll through. I had to open the uh, Apple Podcast. I had to go through there. And I'm like, we never fucking did it. It's just, it's not there. Oops. So here we are. We're making good. Let's not waste any time. Uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation debuted in October of 1987, which I knew with uh, September. Oh my God! Oh, I said, oh, I just kind of did it without memory, and then I looked. At my <laughs> September 28, 1987. The thing um, that's very special to me, anyway, about Next Generation <laughs> is a. Uh, it was the thing that really got me deep, deep into Star Trek because, again, uh, I saw the films, the TOS films. Uh, from Star Trek II on, really with Star Trek IV, which was the year before this, that was big and really got me uh, ladled in. But uh, in September, the other thing going on in my life at age 11 in September uh, of 1987 is I started junior high. Uh, and I started junior high. This show ran for seven years. Middle school, ju junior high or middle school, it's called middle school in our community. Uh, middle school and high school, when the final episode of the show aired... I was graduating from high school. It was like Memorial Day or May. It was basically the third week of May in 1994 is when the final episode of TNG aired. So this series will always be the capsule of time for me. Always be this very series special. is your fucking childhood. It is my childhood. Yeah, because really I started at, I live in, I live in East Grand Rapids, Michigan. We moved into this house that I live in. And my, my childhood home is where my wife and I now live. Uh, we bought it off my mother. She's not dead. So that's usually how that story goes. She just lives <laughs> somewhere else. Um, and, uh, and I started at the junior high uh, in September of 1987. And then I graduated from the senior high or the high school in May of 1994, which is when the series ended. So yeah, you're right. This series, even though I feel that Deep Space Nine on a whole is a stronger series. This oh, yeah. series 
this series, nothing will ever really take the place of it for me personally. So without further ado, let's get into it. 13 episodes uh, to be covered in the first half of TNG. The first episode is actually the first two because it's Encounter at Farpoint. So uh, split into two episodes for syndication, uh, but originally aired as a 90-minute TV I movie. Like. Yes, exactly. So uh, the new Starship Enterprise begins her maiden voyage by uncovering the mysteries of an advanced space station. The crew's mission is threatened by an omnipotent being named Q, who puts them on trial for the crimes of all humanity. No big deal. That's cool. Crimes of all humanity. That's all right. Um, <laughs> it is, uh, you know, like any pilot, uh, there, are, there are a lot of wonky things you never see again. Um, they're uh, just weird little, weird little anachronisms. I mean, things that jump right out at me is that you get, you know, Riker, who's my guy, uh, who uses the expression <laughs> good morning instead of goodbye when he's talking to Grappler's own, good morning, Grappler's own, who the hell talks like that? That's the weirdest shit I've ever heard. And then my other personal favorite involving Riker in kind of the first half of the show, uh, is that he's looking for data. So he's wandering down a corridor and he's, uh, he uh, pulls over this ensign who looks like a legal midget. I mean, it's just a little woman. And she says, hey, ensign, can you help me find it? And she says, yeah, you touch the keyboard, and it shows you. It points you in the direction. And he says, oh, thank you. And he walks off, and it's over her shoulder. And she looks at him and then looks down like she's looking at his ass. I'm like, whoa. I guess ladies are doing it for themselves in the 24th century. But anyway. my, hey, my if, the guy, if the guys are wearing the skirts. Right, the scants, exactly. Oh, the scants, the scants. Yes. Did you notice, did you notice, of the characters introduced, and again, we're not going to be labor like, here's Worf, and here's Tasha Yar, blah, blah, blah. Did you notice, obviously, we have uh, Deanna Troy, uh, you know, and this kicks off the relationship between Riker and Troy, which is kind of the most cherished one uh, for me in all of Star Trek, but did you notice, obviously, she's wearing a scant in this, and it's never seen yes. again, but did you notice in the final shot when Picard is sitting in the chair and it pulls into him and then he goes let's see what's out there and they're going to fly off the Tashier is standing behind him at her station wearing a scant also, yes. never, also never seen again so yeah they looked at the, I, both women probably just went oh, fuck this space cheerleader was the name that it got dubbed space cheerleader <laughs> well because yeah look at Troy in this episode she's wearing a colorful headband and a little skirt and it's just very sexless you know it's just so they obviously decided quite quickly that they needed to get her into a bunny suit with the bun old bun head I think was the nickname of her, her outfit for the rest of the season um but yeah, you got some, you know, you got a lot of groundbreaking stuff. You got a robot crewman or a very, you know, you know, inhuman crewman who's an android. You've got a Klingon, which you're like, whoa, a Klingon, what the hell? And your garden variety, like, okay, you got the blind black guy who flies the ship. Tell me that's not a punchline. I know that was a that was a punchline. For some eighty stand up comic. They said, have you seen that new Star Trek show? The guy flying the ship is a blind black guy. So you know, if somebody crashes a ship, who they're gonna blame, right? Oh, oh, such dated humor. So, see, um, I don't know what I what I loved about it was the whole like that first episode you had the the saucer separation, mm -hmm. and then when they get Riker on board, is it? Yeah, it was Riker. He's like, I want you to, I want you to dock this. Yeah, Picard said to Riker, he's like, yeah, go on, dock it, uh, no automation. And he's like, manually, you bastard. Yeah, yeah exactly. He says, show me what you got. <laughs> yeah, who you talking to? Exactly. So kind of some tough stuff. Then Picard says things like, you know, I don't like kids. They gave me a ship with kids. It totally fucking sucks. So I need you to cover my ass. Uh, then Wesley shows up. And, huh. there's, and then there's the sexy friction between uh, Crusher and uh, Dr. Crusher and Picard, which never goes away, which hopefully yeah. we'll see again in Picard, because that's the that's obviously some, something that's being bandied about me and clamored for. So. So, yeah, this was our big intro to all the characters. Um, the space jellies are the name of the aliens that fly away at the end. And I believe yep. they actually show up in one of the now non canonical uh, novels about the Titan. Uh, the USS Titan that Riker's captain of, because they, they appear on one of the covers of the uh, books, and I didn't read them all, so that that's probably worth a, a little research project. But anyway, any uh, any final thoughts about the episode? Uh, we find out that Q's a dick. 
but uh, he's a love he's a lovable scamp at the same lo- time. Lovable scamp at the same time. So moving on, and I got I, I got to bullshit you. Particularly these first like three or four episodes are super rough. Um, because yes, epi- they are. Because episode two is essentially an homage, a remake, a tip of the hat. Uh, to the very early TOS episode, which we talked about when we reviewed that season, The Naked Time, this is The Naked Now. So it's like, The Naked Now, it sounds like a like an entertainment tonight, like uh, Geraldo Rivera, 80s kind of like, The Naked Now! Uh, so yeah, we got oh, the crew. Yeah. yeah, we got the crew. So obviously this is the first regular hour-length episode. Uh, the crew of the Enterprise finds a scientific vessel dead. Uh, they soon fall prey to a mysterious communicable, communicable contaminant causing the crew to experience symptoms similar to alcohol intoxication threatening the lives of all on board the ship well let's just say that there are some real boners in this episode as it were uh meaning of course funny (laughs) joke as as in the old expression from the 40s that's the famous meme with the joker and i got a real boner for batman anyway yeah so this is our first Wesley Saves the Day episode, because he does exactly that at the end. Um, but, you know, famous beats in this episode, you got Dr. Crusher uh, partially unzipping her outfit and basically telling Captain Picard that he wants her to do the... He wants to he wants her, he wants wants her him to make it so. Oh. Oh, yes. I believe oh, in yeah. the century they call it copulation. <laughs> <laughs> you got... Uh, and I'll save the best for last, but you got... Riker, or you got Troy <laughs> making her first super obvious pass at Riker, um, where he has to pick her up and carry her away like she was a bridegroom. Hello. Um, don't you want to be alone with me? Me in your mind? Oh, God. Who writes this shit? And then, of course, <laughs> the most famous, the big boner, as it were. Alex, that one's yours. The big boner, as it were. Oh, do you mean Lieutenant Yar? Not only knowing everything about security, but also majoring in data entry. <laughs> oh, data entry, data exit, data entry, data exit. <laughs> Wait a minute. You know, half, different, half full, half, half full. You know, different data entry ports, uh, fudge, fudge <laughs> lemonade around the corner. No, okay, I'll just, all right, I'll stop it now. This is getting too dirty. But yes, this was, this was the let's get drunk and... Uh, let's get saucy episode. I don't think Worf ever got drunk because that would be fucked up. I don't know that I'd want to see. Well, Worf. there's a lot of memes out there now. That I I don't know about you, but the whole the whole internet or Facebook uh, uh, Star Trek base is all about the Klingons and the dual penises or peni. <laughs> <laughs> the peni peni. Penile attack, penord, penai. Oh God! Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad he, he. I'm glad he kept both of them in his pants. Moving on. Anyways, Alex, though, before before we go. Oh please. When 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 Denise Crosby, like that door slid open. Dude, I'm sorry. She was fucking hot. It was a hum and a hum. It, and it was. Don't think I didn't think about that when I met her five years ago. So this. Oh was, God! Uh, right. 20, 25 years removed from when that episode aired. Oh, she's still a very handsome woman, without a doubt. Age like a whispered, fine line. She, she just leaned over and whispered in Charlie's ear, I still have the outfit. <laughs> I took it. I took it when I left the show. Oh, Alex, I have teed you up. Okay, so. One, one, of, one, one of probably five worst episodes of the series came in episode number four. Okay, and I I have to take it from Charlie. What were they fucking smoking? Well, you they know, wrote come on. this episode. In fairness, it was the '80s. It was cocaine. Could it? It had to have been maybe yeah. crack. Crack was probably, invented in probably, the '80s. Yeah, it was probably a crack rock because okay. episode number four is Code of Honor. Mm. So. Lieutenant Yar is abducted by the leader of a people who abide by a strong code of honor and must fight to the death. This is hands down the most racist piece of shit episode in Star (laughs) Trek entirety. Like I read articles on this where uh, 
Jonathan Franks and Denise Crosby won't even watch this episode because it was such an embarrassment. Oh, my like God. I have nothing good to say. So they th- these people are it, it looks like they were just beamed up straight out of Africa. It I was, mean, just the costuming and everything, and I'm sure in the 80s that was passable. But you look at it today and you're like, dude, what the fuck? That is like, it's almost like a cultural slam. Denise Crosby, when I, and again, she was a guest at Grand Rapids Comic Con. I'm going to say it was 2016. That's when I met her and I interviewed her on the Eric Zane show when I worked at Cumulus. And uh, she tells a story in her panel. Uh, that uh, right around the same time this was going on, because she was on this show, they were filming Coming to America on an adjoining uh, set at Paramount Pictures. Do you think they stole inspiration or fucking extras to be in this episode? Because it, lo- it looks like fucking wardrobe. They did. I think it is straight out of Zamunda. Zamunda in the 24th century. And it's fucked up. It does not pass. Thumbs down. I just I was rewatching these episodes over the last four or five days and watch this and I'm like I can't fucking wait to talk about this shit. Ah! I just so like seriously if you're watching season one skip number four. It is it is racist. I think it's racist. And you know what's super crazy about it? I'm kind of skimming through this list. Every episode seems to be written by a different group of people. So it it's was. like they're like, here it we gave was. these two people a chance. Oh, that episode was fucked. Let's move on to the next one. Nope, this is bad. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Some of them are like Diane Dwayne, and I know I saw another name in here. DC Fontana is a very famous name, and John D. F. Black is a very famous name in old Star Trek. I know that Diane Dwayne was a was a, a novel writer. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of these are you know people they just kind of rolled in from. Uh, from the old show or from basically Star Trek fiction. It's time to leave it. They were just kind of, but yeah, just scrolling through. It's like Tracy Torme, I know was an ongoing name into a mm-hmm. little bit later in the season, but then he got the ax too. Gene Ronberry had a hand in writing a few of these, which was interesting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but anyway, um, they, they do, they do tend to improve a little bit uh, in quality after we get out of episode four, when we get to episode five of uh, the last outpost, giving us the first kiss of those big eared bastards, that's right, the Ferengi. Uh, and you know what's yes. This is so cool about it, though, is do you recognize one of the Ferengi? Of course, it's Armin Shimmerman who becomes. Yes, it is. Yes, exactly. Yes, it is one of the one of the uh, one. Of, and there is another uh, DS9 luminary that we get not in this episode, but the next one. And I will point it yep. out to you. But anyway, the last outpost, an unknown force, mobilized the Enterprise during the Federation's first encounter. Uh, with a new alien threat, the Ferengi. I kind of like this episode. I mean, the Ferengi's outfit was straight out of, it looked like they also got it off of an 80s movie set with the big, the fur, they had like the furs and the, they were, you know, the, the fur outfit and the whips. It was kind of like, uh, oh, you know, Coman the Bo- Barbarian meets some kind of S&M film. I mean, I don't, you know, was, <laughs> and the Ferengi whips, I don't think you, you rightly end up seeing them Again, until they appear in Enterprise, because the, the the Ferengi make an unnamed appearance in Enterprise that yep. they're like, hey, we snuck them in. But just like within Enterprise, they snuck the Borg in. They don't get named, so it's not really a first contact because they don't know who they're talking to. And it's kind of kind of thin. But anyway, that episode was really great in season one of, of Enterprise. We'll talk to it by the time we we get there. But cool episode. Uh, you know, again, you, you had most of the cast in play because they they were down. Uh, they were down on the planet. You got to see Tasha Yar doing her thing. You got to see Worf doing his thing. You know, for, for an early episode, I thought it was all right. It was it was a landmark for me. I absolutely loved it. I was just taken by the Ferengi. Just the way the Ferengi were so different from every other race. Every other species or race on the show. Just right. the way they talked, the way they moved. It was pretty badass. No, I agree. And what's what's unfortunate is that eventually producers, though they were really created as, and it was even hinted at back in Encounter at Farpoint, that they were going to be the new nemesis in this yeah. era, is that it was determined that they weren't really very threatening because the only thing that they cared about, which was money, could just be produced in a replicator. Like, here's a million dollars. You know, they're, they're not scary. They don't, they, they don't want to conquer and kill and this and that. They want money. 
they is want that platinum. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then they'll, they'll just they'll go away. So uh, episode six, I was wrong when I said there was a guest. It was the episode after this one. So episode seven is the one that has the, the cool guest star. But uh, where no one has gone before. Now, this introduces uh, an important character. Uh, warp efficiency tests send the Enterprise traveling far beyond known space. Uh, where the crew's imagination takes on real form. Ooh, like the holodeck, but not in the holodeck. Yikes! Uh, <laughs> first appearance as Aaron uh, of Eric Menyuk as the Traveler, who we will end up seeing uh, two other times in the series and ends up uh, playing a pivotal role in the fate of one Wesley Crusher. But it was in this episode that Wesley uh, earned his stripe. Well, he didn't really get a stripe because he didn't get his fancy sweater yet. Uh, but he, because ah! he's... He saves the day for a third fucking time within the first six episodes. Uh, he becomes an acting ensign uh, with no no badge, no outfit, but he gets to he gets to sit in the bitch seat on the the horseshoe, uh, you know, to the to, to the to the left of Counselor Troy. Well, it is. It's weird because you got the captain's seat and Riker is to his right, Troy is to his left, and then to the right of Riker, there's like a little space to sit, and then to the to the left of Troy, there's a little space to sit, and sometimes you see Doctor Crusher there or whatever it is. But Wesley's kind of sitting there with his legs crossed. He's like, ee! you know, <laughs> that's such a great look for him. I oh. just I felt so bad for Wesley because he was trying to fucking tell him that guy was phasing out. Yeah. And they're like, that wasn't even the shut up Wesley. Episode. <laughs> no, it wasn't. That, that one does come a little bit later on. But uh, episode seven uh, is Lonely Among Us. Uh, an alien entity possesses uh, Crusher, Worf, and then Picard while the Enterprise is uh, transporting delegates from two shooting planets. The uh, the Sele and the Antican, which not only a couple of interesting things about them, <clears throat> a, uh, a company called Gloob had the action figure license for the first season of Star Trek The Next Generation. They produced completely inactive figures. All, the, all they did is that their legs swung back and forth. And their arms swung back and forth with no joint. Every uh, Starfleet character had a phaser in their hand, and they came with a weird, like, over-the-shoulder thing that I I don't know what it was supposed to be. <laughs> but the other characters built for this line was there was Q in his fancy robes, there's one Ferengi, and there was a Sele and an Antican from this episode. Um, so, and the only other appearance of this race besides... Uh, this episode and then those action figures is they come back in Lower Decks as a gag in one of those yep. episodes there where they're making fun of them. So that's all we see out of them. But bigger still, one of the, and I can't I can't necessarily tell them apart, but they're, they're, uh, one of them's like a snake lizard people and the other one is like a bear wolf dog people. And one of the bear wolf dog people was Mark Alimo, who is Goldicott and the Romulan that we yes, see. Yes, he is. Season. So, I mean, he's a guy much like Vaughn Armstrong, who we, we talked about in a previous episode, has the crossover. He's just been so many different races of aliens. Um, so, yeah. Uh, all right, episode, you know, yeah, n nothing super duper special. You know, the captain beams out into space at the end, but they're able to beam him back. And I don't know, ultimately kind of forgettable, except for probably the stuff about the aliens and the guest star, I would say. Oh, first <laughs> episode where you see the as yet unnamed... Uh, character played by Colomini, who is Miles O'Brien. Yes. He doesn't get a name until season two, but the, we saw him. He was the uh, Battle Bridge flight controller, Khan, in episode one in, in, in Encounter at Farpoint, wearing a red suit, like you would expect someone to be uh, sitting in the flight controller position to be. In this episode, he has the gold suit, which is what he wears for the rest of the series. Uh, two series, because obviously he's the main character in DS9. So, uh, <laughs> moving on to episode eight. Just when we thought we'd gotten into some kind of a groove where maybe the stories make sense a little bit, then we <laughs> get justice. Uh, Stay rather, off the grass, man. Stay off the grass. Maybe you just want to call it Bustus, because the Enterprise uh, goes to this world where Wesley breaks... Uh, an idyllic uh, world's trivial law by accidentally stepping on flowers and faces a death sentence. Well, that sounds very generic. But what the deal with the society is, yeah, they're very idyllic. And they're very idyllic about the fact that they wear basically scraps and they never stop having sex. 
they are they're, they're the Edo is the name of the of the word of, of the species. <laughs> and they and even though you see, you know, one is grabbing on one is like, oh, it's great to see you. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you figure that is funny because Riker and a, a small away team went down <clears throat> and then they come back up and give a report and then they go down again. You just know. And I think Jordy was on that, too, that Riker got at least a little bit of puss when he was down there. And maybe Jordy as well. I don't know. Because they seem very like, do you see Jordy's line? He sits back down at a station and he's like, uh, yeah, they make love at a drop of a hat. And if he wasn't wearing the visor, you would have heard, wank. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, God. I don't know. The only thing he was missing was lighting up a cigarette. Yeah, right. Ooh, big smoking a cigar on the on the turbo lift back to the bridge. So anyway, fun episode. And again, uh, social commentary, maybe, you know, I mean, I, I but in some ways not because like, yeah, there are still societies and uh, that, that believe in corporal punishment, but they don't believe in corporal punishment and similarly believe in like complete free sex and love. Uh, and if there is, please let me know and I'll, I'll beam on down and do a little Riker and Jordy and I'll do a little bit of the second investigation. See what we can find out. So, <laughs> so this actually led me with a question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Should they have intervened with the death sentence? What if, what if they decided, Oh, we can't fuck with that. That's too close to the prime directive. But I mean, see you Wes. Yeah, right. Well, okay, it's uncontested. Well, I mean, here's the thing. You know, it's it was kind of a weird morality play at the end of it because it was the the Edo God thing or whatever that was in orbit with them kind of made the final decision. You know, are they gonna are they gonna stay? Or are they gonna go? Uh, and at the end of it, it did let them beam away. So yeah, it seems like the answer to the question is is that the Edo the Edo God said it was okay uh, for them to to depart. So. Uh, yeah, but you're right. They could have just, but wh how would that have, you know, borne fruit with Picard's efforts to get with Beverly? You know what I mean? Well, like, I don't oh, know, because later on, Beverly gets ghost trained. Yeah, she really does. And boy, I tell you, when we get to other, you know, unbelievably awful uh, episode, uh, opposite, blah, 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 unbelievably awful episodes of the show, that one's deep into season seven. So it's going to be a while before we get there. But oh boy, you know, buckle in because we're going to go ape shit on that one count on it <laughs> oh my goodness so uh episode whoops yeah that was episode eight. Right. this is episode episode nine uh is the battle and again the ferengi are back um and it's funny because this this appearance of the ferengi is a little bit more menacing but it's funny at the end the 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 main villain kind of gets his just desserts based on Frank silo norm. So I think, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. So, uh, Frankie captain returns the abandoned stargazer, which was Picard's previous command from about 10 years beforehand. Was that, uh, was that the one where he lost uh, crusher? Yes. Yeah. That happened just probably, uh, two or three years before he lost the ship altogether. He, he had lost Jack crusher. Um, uh, but yeah, so it, uh, the stargazer is returned. Uh, Picard starts to experience severe headaches and begins to relive the battle of Maxia in which he lost the ship. Um, so the whole thing is really cooked up by, uh, the Ferengi daemon or captain Bach, uh, who in the, uh, the battle of Maxia, which was an unidentified ship, nine years previous, had attacked the Stargazer and crippled it to the point they had to abandon it, but Picard was able to destroy the attacking ship, while well, the captain of the attacking ship was Bach's son. Uh, so Bach had been planning his revenge, and he went through this uh, elaborate ploy. He found the he found the derelict ship. He used a thought controlling device uh, to try to get Picard to relive it and, and to use the ship to destroy the Enterprise. Um, so obviously that doesn't work out. Um, but it's funny. It, it's it's such a thin. It's like this was the cheapest set ever for the Stargate. Yeah, well, yes, it was. Because they took the uh, they took the multi purpose bridge from the Star Trek movies. So like Star Trek's one, two, and three, and really in four. Though they they did a brand new shiny Enterprise bridge at the end of that movie for the Enterprise A. Uh, but this was just basically that, and they put some dirt on it, and they smudged some shit on the walls, and it was like it's because. It's funny if you think about it. Is you know probably even in any naval vessel in the United States Navy or really any any navy around the world, 
I'm sure a lot of your shit just looks the same, right? So I see yeah. you go on you go onto the you go onto the conning tower or the bridge of of this aircraft carrier. It's going to look like this aircraft carrier because they were built at the same time or whatever. And so yeah, you uh, there's no reason to think that you know bridge designs would be like going into a mire or a target. There's so many different layouts, and that's all they look like because they're mass produced. Um, but uh, yeah, so in the end of it. Bach kind of gets his his comeuppance because he is arrested and broken of rank because the mission he was undertaking was not profitable. And again, that's all the Frankie care about. So this guy wanted vengeance. Well, there was no money in it, so nobody is going to support him, and that's why he gets arrested. So that yeah, that is, he, yeah. That, when they cuffed him and they were hauling him away, all you could hear him scream was Moogie! Calling for his mama. All right, episode 10. We get the return of Q. Q returns to the Enterprise. Wait, I just said that. To tempt Commander <laughs> Riker into joining the Q continuum with the lure of Q's powers. Now, let's face it. This is a test that just about anybody would fail. Because if, if you could do anything, uh, I don't think that you would have a Sophie's Choice moment at the end and give it up. But... <laughs> this is this is this is a TV show. So we had kind of some kind of some fun twists and turns in this one. So we had uh, you know Q sets the stage by um, beaming them down to this environment that's just an alien world, um, but it's also the French Revolution. So you got weird aliens dressed like French troopers. So he's like really harking on um, you know Picard being a fr- being an English Frenchman. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. by. By railing all this stuff, and then, yeah, he, um, so, yeah, he puts Riker in the position of, well, you can only save your friends, but you have, you have my power. And this was the first time that we got to see Wesley got killed, which was awesome. The first time that you get to see Wesley <laughs> get killed, which was awesome. Um, but, uh, yeah, in, in the end, you know, Picard, he comes back to the ship, and Picard says, well, you, you can't use his power because it's too great a temptation. And uh, then Riker finally says, F you. He starts calling him Jean-Luc, which is like, bruh. You know, he's like, what, what, you yeah. gonna do, what you gonna do about it? Um, we go through this weird sequence where he grants everybody a wish. So, Jordy gets his sight, but then says he doesn't want it. Uh, Riker says he'll make Data human. Data says he doesn't want it. He turns Wesley into an adult man, and the guy looks like a porn star. And in the end, he doesn't <laughs> he does. want it. Yes, he does. And, and, then, we, and, and, then we, and then we see Will Wheaton later on in yeah. life, and you're like, he looks nothing like this. You're like, what the fuck happened to that guy? Oh, my God. Uh, you get, and this is our first taste of, I was funny, I was reading, because I, I watched the episode today or a couple days ago, and this was our first touch of seeing a female Klingon, uh, I was going to say female Klingon woman, a, a female Klingon not only... Uh, in the next generation for the first time, but since the original uh, series really fully fleshed out with the outfit and the head bridges and the snarling, and it was like kind of made my wiener feel a little funny. Uh, I think when I first saw it, because I was like, God damn, you know. I, I guess when, you know when, when you're 11 years old, you don't really know what a dirty girl is, but uh, <laughs> that was a dirty girl. <laughs> All I gotta say is we don't talk about it with outsiders. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, so in the end, obviously, Riker uh, foregoes his powers. Very, you know, obviously something else the plot line of Wonder Woman 84 st- uh, stole from because uh, yep. it's too good to be true. Uh, and Q goes about it. Q gets snapped back by the Q continuum because he failed uh, to convert uh, Riker to their ways because they wanted, they wanted a human vessel to understand humanity and Riker basically give them the big finger. And uh, it was funny, in Q's next appearance next season, he said, uh, no, no, it was two seasons later, he said, they, they refused one of Q's requests, and Q goes, oh, Riker, you're so stolid. You weren't like this before the beard. Mm. Oh. What beard? Hmm? <laughs> I, I guess I guess what I would take away from episode 10 is Riker is good. But Riker could be better. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I'm full of them tonight. That's oh, oh you're full of something. All right. Oh, uh, <laughs> episode 11. Now, this this is probably my favorite episode of the first half of the season because it is a, a very poignant Riker and Troy. You know, anybody who's ever had a true love and Imzadi, you, you see, you know, you see this one and it's just you're, you're seeing the love of your life going off to marry somebody else. And that just. 
it's devastating. I, I would imagine it hasn't actually happened to me, but I, I feel it. You know what I mean? So uh, Loaxana Troy, first appearance of Troy's mother, played by Nigel Barrett. Roddenberry. I know. Jean Roddenberry's wife. She was uh, Nurse Chapel from the original series. She was number one, first officer to Captain Pike. Yep. Uh, in the unaired pilot, The Cage, which we got to figure out a time to break that episode down. I did not work that into our schedule, but we should we should do that. We should have one standalone episode just to break down The Cage. So I'll go back to the uh, I'll go back to the schedule and look at that. We'll get that in sometime. Um, but uh, yeah, and so this was her debut and a role that she played uh, not only in this show but also in Deep Space Nine many times. But uh, yeah, so Waxana visits her daughter and prepares her for an arranged marriage. Now. Granted, the guy that she's marrying, and he's a, he's a character actor who he's still seeing stuff today, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but a very handsome dude. Um, but the real rub is that you know she she still loves Riker, he still loves her, but they are just like there's too much time and space between us. There's just I just think a very poignant scene on the holodeck between the two of them where they're discussing their relationship, and it just makes me think of. A relationship from my past that I'm just not going to dig too deep into didn't involve marriage, but definitely involved, you know, a girl and feelings and separated and, you know, weren't really meant to be together. And so this episode, it kind of sticks with me for that reason. I hated this episode. You son of a bitch. I know, oh, right? Go on. No, no. Okay. I hated it because at that point, and I don't even think it was a term yet, but at that point, of my childhood when I was watching this, I was already shipping Riker and Troy. Mm. Well, I was to say that's not too that's not too hard to pick out. But yeah. And I was I was already shipping them and I I wanted them to be together. And when this was I I was like I was looking at Troy like you bitch. Really? He's a and, handsome, he's a handsome dude, but you know what was she going to do? I mean, in the final analysis, obviously, it doesn't work out. He goes off to save this ship of lepers or whatever, and she <laughs> stays on the show, and she and Riker are probably doing it on the down low. You know, they're, they're, you know awesome. and, and eventually they end up together anyway. So, um, okay, so the big uh, – no, we have two left. Excuse me. Uh, episode 12 is the big goodbye. <laughs> this is the first in a never-ending – Plot device trope that that just never goes away uh, until I I never I, got tired of it. I I, I, I mean it, it went on through it went on through this show, it went on through DS Nine, it went yep. on into Voyager. Uh, didn't happen in Enterprise, and then we've not. Well, well, now we've seen it in Lower Decks because it takes place, yep. you know, and and, and and more played for laughs the way it is here. But uh, the big goodbye, uh, computer malfunction traps Picard data. Uh, Dr. Crusher and uh, and some idiot named Waylon. Uh, <laughs> you never really figure out if he's a civilian or if he's Starfleet, but he's a dummy. Um, yes. In a Dixon Hill holodeck program set in early 20th century Earth. So Dixon Hill, uh, and again, this has become a big thing. Dixon Hill makes a handful of comebacks. I think the last Dixon Hill story you see is maybe in season four and and by that that point, Whoopi Goldberg is part of the cast, and she's in that segment. Yeah. It's it's, it's kind of cute. Gloria from Cleveland. Remember Gloria from Cleveland? That was that yep. was Whoopi Goldberg's character. But uh, yeah, it's set in San Francisco, 1941, uh, and you know how that technology is very new at this point. So you get the feeling the Galaxy Class is one of the first ships that has a fully functional holodeck, um, because the characters are just they. They're just, it's a, they're just st short stroking it all over the place. They're, I mean, they have a staff meeting that they're talking about it for five minutes. Oh, it was so real. And I saw an automobile and I saw blah, blah, blah. And they're like, rah, 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 rah. They're, just, <laughs> they're a little too fascinated by a thing that real quickly, as soon as, you know, they, they go to, you know, they go to install a new version of, you know, McAfee, uh, you know, virus protection, the ship gets fucked up and the holodeck becomes deadly. So, the holodeck safeties. God damn it, Badgie. Yeah, exactly. The holodeck shouldn't have safeties. There shouldn't be the option to make them deadly. It should just be no matter what, when you're in the holodeck, you can't get hurt. No matter you could you could jump off a 300 story building, and you can't get hurt. You could get hit by a, you could get your head chopped off by one of Worf's holodeck monsters. You can't get hurt. But 
Nobody ever really thought about that. So the holodeck is extremely dangerous. Uh, so they get caught in a situation where they can't escape. They're trapped by mobsters. This Waylon guy unknowingly, he's like, oh, give me the gun. And the guy shoots him and he's like, oh, but it's not real. Why am I dying? You assume, <laughs> you assume he lives, but you can assume that I don't give a shit. Um, so yeah, yeah he, so he had a he had a red shirt on under his under his holodeck costume. I'd say it was certainly red when he got shot. Oh! oh! So anyway, at the end, obviously, our people get away, and there's an alien contact mission that Picard has to recite some weird speech, and he pulls <laughs> that shit off. And uh, it, you know, and the the race, the Harada, uh, is never seen, and I think that that would be. It'd be a cool one to touch upon again because they sound like they're super badass. Yeah. But but we we never we never they get one name drop. Uh, actually, it's funny they get a name drop in season two, where they re- remember the pack leads who were the 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 bad yep. guys in the series finale yep. of uh, uh, Lower Decks. Well, when they're meeting them for the first time, and Riker goes, Troy's like, they're I don't know, they're dangerous. And he's like, well, they're certainly not Harada or Romulan. So it's like they get a name drop as obviously being a badass on the same level as the Romulans, but you never see him again. I think they got utilized in a novel and on the novelization, I think it's one of the books I've read. There's a picture of one of them supposed to look like it just looks like a bug person. So it's like I'm more laughing at it than I'm scared of it. But I mean, maybe they're really badass. You don't know. Um, So. Uh, last episode we're going to talk about, episode 13, is Data Lore. Ooh! Uh, one of the few episodes where they screw up the early conventions of using star dates. Star dates in Next Generation are five digits with a nope. decimal, single decimal. Uh, in the log entry at the beginning, when Riker is beaming down, he only uses four digits plus a decimal. Mm-hmm. Oh, how could you? Must be because Gene Roddenberry did the teleplay. He screwed it up on purpose. Nobody, It was a test and nobody passed it. Well, uh, what, if that, or what if it was just like one of those things where he fucked up on the line and no one caught it? Well, obviously nobody caught it because they never read You know, it was a... She it was a caught it? Well, it was, well, I caught it because I read it in a book. So oh, somebody I thought caught you were on payroll. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, well, I, you know, I should be. But, I mean, yeah, it, and the thing is, it was a voiceover, so it would have been easy to catch and fix. And not have to reshoot anything, but nobody caught it. So anyway, the Enterprise finds a disassembled android identical to Data at the site of the Omicron Theta colony, where Data was found some 25 years earlier, uh, which was destroyed by a life form dubbed the Crystalline Entity. The reassembled android lore brings the Crystalline identity uh, entity to the Enterprise. What a great guy. So Lore is basically Data <laughs> if Data was a fucking asshole. That's basically who Lore is. <laughs> like if I was freaking Data. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Data is walking around drinking beer, uh, <laughs> having a little puff puff here and there. <laughs> so yeah, Lore is, you know, So and then you have to do the, the identical twin thing, much like Captain Kirk in the, the season one episode, uh, The Enemy Within, where he's split in half by the transporter. So eventually they got to switch clothes and people don't know which one is which and blah, blah. So at the end of it, I mean, Laura's scary as shit. He's going to be like, uh, he, he smacks like, he bitch slaps Worf. <laughs> Across it. Oh. Yeah. And then he <laughs> he threatens to set Wesley on fire. Uh, yep. Which, which that's that's not such a bad thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> Most people are pretty okay with that. Um, but at the end of it, that you know, Data outsmarts him and they beam him into space, and then that's just they just that's just kind of the end of it. And then they fly off. Lore does make a return in season four, and then for the cliffhanger between season six and seven. And then it was funny. I was thinking about this because I watched this earlier today. I was thinking about. It, I thought Lore at the end of is spoiler alert at the the end of his final appearance is disassembled. Ooh, or listen to me yawn. Oxford would be yelling at me right now. Laura is dis- Laura is disassembled, um, and then you know I'm thinking about Picard and the Daystrom Institute where they have, you know, you remember at the end of uh, in Nemesis, yep. Data's uh, memory is downloaded into B4, and uh, his memory is not saved because it's degraded. Like whatever happened to the pieces of lore? Couldn't they figure out some way to to you know get, brainwash him and make him good and then upload Data into his brain? It's like. <laughs> It seems like they were really missing the boat on that one. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, they were, they were. You know, but I, I don't know. Uh, episode thirteen really could have been 
space parent trap. Right, exactly. But of course, they weren't trying to get anybody uh, back. They weren't trying to get mom and dad back together. They were just trying to kill everybody. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> if you if you have this on Blu-ray, like I know you're not a disc collector. No, no, no I, I've got all the discs. I mean, with, with, so, with, with the Star Treks, I made an exception. I have the discs. So watch it on Blu-ray. I can't even keep a straight face when I'm saying that. <laughs> so I was going to be like, so there was a cut scene where they're down there and they're down on Omicron Theta and they see Lore disassembled. And then there's this cut scene where Lieutenant Yar looks over at Lore's crotch and then looks at Data's crotch and then looks at Lore's crotch and goes, this is bigger. No, you are so full of shit. That didn't happen. <laughs> that is disgusting. That's also the end of our show. So, Alex, why don't you take us on? That has been the, that, that has been the first 13 episodes of TNG. And again, a big oopsie on us that we didn't record this like three months ago. But uh, we're all, uh, unlike Data and Lore, we're only human. But anyway, you were going to say. I was going to say, uh, we don't have it scheduled, but there was kind of a little uh, news. Uh, it came out last week. There was a news story, and I kind of think it's relevant for the times, the, okay. the hard times we're in. Uh, Sir Patrick Stewart got the first uh, COVID injection the, yes. the, to before they started filming Picard. Yes. So... Wonderful. I thought that was very cool, the the first immunization of the series. And, you know, it's – if that shows anything, that's – yeah. I, exactly. Just wear your mask, be smart, wash your hands. <laughs> We're not afraid to be scientifically driven on this show because this is a show about science and the love of humanity. And so, yeah, we're very, we're very pro-mask. And we're very pro vaccine on the show. Deal with it. It's Star Trek. The same, the same way that I, and here's another side piece of news. Uh, Star Trek Discovery was nominated for a Glad Award. I read I, that. I, you just posted I just that posted that. that. Show. And, and you know what? I posted that on our group forums. And I hope to hell that we don't get any nasty feedback about it because those are not people who are going to be in our group anymore. Because you know what? Star Trek is about diversity uh, and ce celebrating the diversity of all of us uh, on this planet is what Gene Roddenberry had in mind. So I, I cannot believe in my heart of hearts that people who really get, you don't know, see my air quotes, get Star Trek would be upset about something like this or call it political. So I haven't yeah. checked my feeds, but if I see somebody who's torn into me, they're going to get fired real quick. Oh. So. oh yeah. Like, and you know, it's sad, but you know, the neck beards are going to just eat. Oh yeah. Up. It's terrible. But anyway, let's not focus on the negative. Let's focus on, ending the show and teeing you up for the next time. So Alex, that's on you. All right. So for more information about Starfleet International in Michigan and beyond, please on Facebook, go visit USS Graham Petoskey and or the USS Septarian. The Code 47 podcast is part of the Secret Friends Unite podcasting network and is produced by the head of the Q continuum, Todd Oxtra. The, the the cue ball continuum. Oh, <laughs> oh. oh my goodness. Holy cow. Well, um, thanks for joining us, friends. Uh, we are over on Twitter at 47 podcast. That is a few uh, a few of our different Twitter handles because we are uh, a total of four programs. We're also the Secret Friends Unite podcast. That's Todd and myself talking about general geek topics. Co-op mode podcast is uh, Mark the Canardian and Todd talking about video games. And of course you are listening to code 47 and I can't believe it didn't even have his in there. Mark and I also do a bi-weekly show, which Alex is joining us, uh, called the hollow Cron Chronicles. That must be even before I started that show. That's why the notes aren't in here. Hollow Cron Chronicles is bi-weekly and talks about star Wars. So yeah, uh, boy, I have truncated notes for this one. You know what? I'm not even going to buy. I've, I've had enough talking uh, This is over on T public. We've got a great swag store. Uh, all benefits to that uh, go to a charity that I belong to here in Michigan uh, that does outreach uh, for Michigan children. Um, and that's about it. We'd love to hear from you. That'd be great. But I will say good night to you. Uh, sharing is caring and keep on trucking. Be good to one another, live long and prosper.